People have been asking me for my take on mega texturing, also known as virtual texturing, the technology used in Rage. The game got mixed press at launch due to some glitches, and they gave mega textures a bit of a bad name. But what is this technology? What does it do? Is it any good? Was it a mistake? Now, before I get into this, I need to make one thing very clear. The technology behind Rage is often credited solely to id Software technical director John Carmack. That's not always correct, since a project of this size is going to involve a lot of people. Still, with anything this personal, it's easy to confuse criticism of the work with the criticism of the person. More importantly, I am not anywhere near an expert on this technology. I'm good at translating technological ideas into plain English, but I'm actually at the opposite end of the programming spectrum from John Carmack. He's at the forefront of inventing new stuff, and I've spent most of my career squeezing new tricks out of old technology. If John Carmack is a NASA engineer designing the next space shuttle, then I'm a guy building a trebuchet in the junkyard. Both are worthy pursuits, actually, but these are very different disciplines. A final disclaimer is that I'm saying all of these things with the benefit of years of hindsight. I don't pretend to have any advantage over Carmack, and I can admit without shame that the guy is way, way smarter than I am. Okay, disclaimer over. Let's talk about mega texturing. Before trying to understand mega texturing, it can be helpful to try and understand the problem that mega texturing was designed to solve. A texture map is just an image used to give the game world, well, texture. If you take a picture of bricks and apply that picture to a flat polygon, then your eye will accept that polygon as a brick wall. Textures are what make things in the world look like they're made of metal or stone or plastic or flesh or dirt or whatever. If you've got a great big wall in the game, you can have your texture map repeat, like patterned wallpaper. The problem is that if your wall is really big, then that repeating pattern will look very artificial or cheap to the player. It's distracting and ugly. It's like having a bit of scenery fall over during a play. It's a reminder that the whole thing is a facade. Now, you can mitigate this if you just stretch the texture out a bit more. Instead of having it repeat many times, just have it repeat once. But then you end up with the problem of having too few pixels stretched over too large an area. It looks blurry and cheap, and once again it pulls the player out of the experience. Of course, the obvious solution is to just use more pixels. Use a larger texture map with more data. If the texture itself is larger, then it will have more detail. This is exactly what's been going on in the industry. If you're a PC gamer, this is why each new generation of graphics card has more memory than the one before. Developers are making bigger and bigger textures to cram in as much detail as they can. Unfortunately, the solution scales poorly. If you want something to look twice as good, you need four times as much memory. The worst case scenario is the one where you have a huge wall that can be viewed both at a distance and up close, and needs to look good in both situations. There's no way around it. This requires a ton of data. Now here's where it gets tricky. Not everything needs the same amount of detail. You need lots of detail on objects that will be examined up close. Faces, weapons, office clutter. There needs to be a lot of detail in these items even though they're small. Other objects are viewed only in passing, or in the dark, or at a distance, or through explosions, and don't need much detail at all. When developing a game, the programmer will usually give the artist some kind of texture budget. This is how much data you're allowed to cram on screen at one time. The closer you get to the limit, the better your game will look. But if you use too much, if you go over that limit, then the graphics card can run out of memory. Without getting into the technical details, this is very, very bad. The game won't crash, but it will usually slow down to the point where it becomes unplayable. So it's in your interest to play this game of brinkmanship, where you try to use as much data as possible without going over the limit. A limit which will be different for each person based on their individual computer and setup. Welcome to the uncertain world of multi-platform PC development. This is bad. 
In general, you don't want to ask your artists to worry about technical stuff. They have enough things to worry about with their tools and their craft, and in a perfect world they shouldn't need to care about the inner workings of your game engine. It's like insisting that the person giving your car a custom paint job understand all the inner workings of the no-slip differential. One final problem with traditional texturing is that it just doesn't lend itself very well to organic or rounded surfaces. If you've ever tried to put down a tile floor in an old house, you've probably discovered what a nightmare it is to get the tiles to line up when the walls aren't at perfect 90 degree angles. You can imagine how much harder it would be if you were trying to put down tile in a round room with curving slopes to the floor. It's hard to get everything to line up just right, and fussing with those little details can eat up a lot of artist hours. It's easier to stick to boxy rooms and corridors, even if the computer is capable of drawing more interesting spaces. One of the things that makes a game world look artificial or fake is if the visuals are too homogenous. Walls, even simple ones made of white drywall, are usually not perfect surfaces. You might think of a carpet as a solid plane of a single color, but unless it was installed yesterday, it's actually a complex map of entropy. Colors fade, carpet fibers thin out, and the surface warps. You might not notice it, but your brain does. Your brain is constantly searching for patterns in the world around you, and gets bored quickly if exposed to too much repetition. If every piece of furniture in the game world is flawless, every carpet looks new, and every wall is perfectly uniform, then the world can start to look kind of strangely cartoonish or fake. It's a subtle effect, but it gets stronger as you get closer to photorealism. It's the same thing George Lucas discovered when making the first of the Star Wars movies. It's easier to make something feel authentic if you make everything look worn, scuffed, and used. The upshot is that we need a way to add a lot of unique details to surfaces without blowing our texture budget. Enter Mega Textures. The idea is that instead of cutting up the world into distinct textures, there's just one ultra-massive texture draped over everything. Artists no longer need to worry about texture borders or fuss with the detail versus repetition trade-off. The game only loads in the bits needed to draw the things right in front of the player. As you move around, the game is constantly pulling in new texture pieces and throwing away ones it no longer needs. You can really see mega textures at work in this large open area of rage. Those crisscrossing tire tracks wouldn't have been practical to pull off without mega texturing. Here you can see we have one huge unbroken surface. These tire tracks match the topography of the landscape without any messy seams or repetition. You can also see it in these rock formations. In other games, it's common to just take something rock-shaped and slap a rock-like texture over it, but in Rage, it's possible for artists to depict different strata in the rock, for them to hint at the effects of erosion on exposed rock faces, and to introduce constant variations to avoid repeating patterns. Now, it's probably possible to do these things without mega textures, but it would be much, much harder and way more time-consuming. The other visual advantage of Mega Textures is that it seems to have given the id artists a lot more freedom with regards to architecture. I could be wrong about this one, but it seems like Rage is just a little more organic and a little more round than other games. I attribute this to the fact that texture artists didn't need to spend a bunch of time getting square textures to line up on curved surfaces. I really applaud the intent here. Instead of introducing a new graphical gimmick, mega texturing is there to give artists more freedom. Computers now have so much power, it's nice to see it used for something besides the brute force approach of making things look better by just rendering more polygons. I've said before that from now on, visual improvements will be driven by artists more than processor technology. At launch, Rage got a lot of bad press for graphical glitches and blurry visuals. Some of these problems were due to QA lapses and driver problems, but were unfortunately blamed on mega texturing. This is not to say the technology is without drawbacks. There are a lot of costs associated with mega texturing, aside from the obvious price that was paid to develop it. 1. Development costs. 
While the game did free up artists to add details without worrying about texture budget, it also required a lot more total work to fill in the game world. In other game engines, artists might have slapped a couple of simple, cheap textures under this highway, since it's a bit out of the way and only viewed at high speed. In Rage, the underside of the bridge is filled with wonderful, interesting detail. That's nice, but was it worth all of this extra work to add details that nearly everyone will overlook? It's not that I don't appreciate the artistry that went into it, but is this something that's financially feasible in the long run? 2. Massive Game Files Since we're not reusing rectangle textures, every square inch of the game world has its own bit of texture. This means a lot more total texture data, which means the game takes up a lot more space. This isn't a huge problem, but I don't think anyone is really in a hurry to go back to the days of disk swapping, and a lot of people in the world still pay for their internet by the gigabyte. So this can have the side effect of making the game more expensive to distribute. Again, this isn't a deadly flaw, but are the improvements in Rage worth doubling or even quadrupling the size of games? 3. Compression Costs as huge as Rage is, the data would be even bigger if it wasn't compressed. It takes a very high-end, powerful computer a very long time to crank all those gigabytes of textured data through a compression system to get them down to a manageable size. This means it's probably infeasible for people with consumer-level hardware to add new levels to the game, which puts a damper on any possible modding community. 4. Technical Limitations Despite the promise of freedom for texture artists, there still seem to be some rather annoying limitations for would-be designers. Note this baffle wall in the town of Wellspring, which seems to serve no other purpose than to block line of sight from one part of town to another. The old limits of how much texture data you could show at once has kind of been replaced with new limits on how much surface area you can show at once, which is a very similar kind of problem. The upshot is your artists are still going to have to worry about technical problems for a while. 5. The PlayStation 3 Sony's strange cell architecture made it particularly hard to implement mega texturing on the PlayStation 3. Now, this is always a touchy subject, mostly because of the dysfunctional culture that surrounds modern gaming machines. Critiquing a console from an engineering standpoint will land you in an argument with people defending the machine from a consumer standpoint, which doesn't lead anywhere useful. Maybe someday I'll break down what I think is wrong with the PS3, but let's just skip that battle for now. The point is, for mega texturing to be viewed as an unqualified success, it needed to work on all the major platforms, but certain sacrifices were required to get it working with Sony's memory segregation. You can blame mega texturing or you can blame the PS3, but it doesn't change the fact that PS3 players were often unhappy with their version of Rage. In the end product, the texture detail seems to have been dialed back a bit to get the system working on current gen machines. Which means this little computer keyboard in Rage has about the same level of detail as a similar object in Half-Life 2 which came out seven years earlier. I'm sure somewhere around the id software offices is a hard drive with a master copy of this object showing all the wonderful detail we're not seeing. We came all this way, and the real benefits of mega texturing wound up on the cutting room floor. Again, this is conjecture on my part, but I think the number one reason that things worked out this way is the fact that it just simply takes too much time and too much money to try something new. In the old days, if you had an idea, you could just throw together a prototype in a week, test it out, and decide if you liked it or not. You don't have this luxury of experimentation when it takes months to develop your prototype and dozens of people just to make some test content. This effect is multiplied if you have to build different prototypes for all of your hardware platforms. I suggest that the costs of mega texturing only became apparent once id Software had already gone all in with it, and changing technology would have required starting over. And we all know how well that usually works out. Wrapping up, I wouldn't write off mega textures. There's still a lot of work that could be done in this area, and a few ways that these various costs could be mitigated. It's easy to look back on Rage and pick apart all the flaws with mega texturing, but only with the benefit of hindsight. None of this was obvious way back in 2004 when these ideas were first being considered. 
At one time, bump mapping was an idea on some engineer's dry erase board, and now it's part of almost every major game on the market. There's no way to know if your idea is the next bump mapping except to try it. The old saying goes, nothing ventured, nothing gained? Unfortunately, to venture anything these days costs millions of dollars in a couple of years. I also want to point out that the only reason we can have this conversation is because of the transparency within id software and their willingness to talk about their technology. I'm sure a lot of companies try new things, but they don't divulge anything, and so the rest of us can't learn anything from the process. So I want to say thanks to id software for being willing to try new things and being willing to talk about them openly. And while I'm at it, thanks for Rage, which I think was kind of underrated.